absolutely delighted to have you here today. And our topic for today is rising to the cloud in 2021 tips to accelerate your cloud migration. Uh, my name is June Bauer and I am your host and I am so happy that you've taken the time to join. Um, we are so lucky today because we have got a wonderful panel that is going to be answering some questions that I have for them, but they're also going to be here to answer your questions. So I really welcome your participation today. If you have a question, uh, go ahead and put it into the Q&A at the bottom of your screen to the right, you'll see a Q&A button. Um, or you can put it in the chat as well, but we'd love to have you put your Q&A questions in. We'll actually take those at the end uh, of the discussion. But as we're going along, if something pops in your head that you want to ask about, please feel free to just uh, put it into the Q&A. Um, we'd love to have this be interactive. So we're going to start today with introductions. And as I said, we've got an, an amazing panel here today. So let's just go to the next slide and introduce our panel. So um, I'm gonna let each panelist introduce themselves. They'll do a much better job than I could do. So uh, Husin, go ahead and introduce yourself and welcome. And I do not, it looks like he might've dropped off. So let's start with Ravi instead. So. <laughs> Ravi, we're so happy to have you. Why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Yeah, so glad to be here. Hey, I'm Ravi Lockman. Uh, I run the evangelism team at Harness. So if you're unfamiliar with Harness, uh, we're a CI, CD service, uh, platform as a service. And a little bit of my background, um, I've been a distributed systems engineer for a while. I've worked at a few firms, um, IBM, Red Hat, and Mesosphere, and, and Epidemics also, we forget that one. Uh, and yeah, it's been building large scale uh, distributed systems. And now it's love to talk about engineering efficiency. Fantastic. Great intro. Thank you. Um, and uh, Max, please introduce yourself. Hello, my name is Max Martinov. I am CTO of Grid Dynamics. have been uh, with the company for about uh, 13 years, pretty much since the inception of the company in uh, 2006. And uh, we are helping uh, Fortune uh, 1000 enterprises uh, to accelerate digital transformation. And cloud migration is one of the big areas of the digital transformation nowadays. Awesome, that's great. And um, it looks like Hussein is back. So Hussein, just in time, we'd love to have you introduce yourself. Yep, apologize for the disconnect. <laughs> Bad <laughs> Wi-Fi connectivity over here. So um, my name is Hussein Chandra, uh, Senior Director, Chief Architect at JCP. Uh, it's a great privilege uh, to be invited to this uh, panelist uh, for obvious reasons, of course. And uh, the reason why is because I spearheaded and embarked on the cloud migration journey for JCPenney uh, back in 2016. And of course, partnering with uh, Grid Dynamics, that's the first time I met um, Max. And um, we basically migrated the e-commerce platform uh, from on-prem uh, monolithic platform to cloud native and microservices platform, right? And we also established the cloud native um, data lake as well in the cloud. And during, those, during that journey, I, I was responsible for establishing the cloud engineering and operations team, which includes DevOps site reliability engineering, um, performance engineering as well, and the advanced analytics team. And looking forward to basically share my experience with all of you guys and lessons learned. That's it. Thank you, Husin. that's fantastic. So we've got a great panel. Um, just a little intro on myself. I come from primarily the technology marketing world, having started at Apple in the early 80s, before the Macintosh was even developed, and uh, ultimately becoming the consumer marketing uh, manager for the Macintosh. Um, and I've gone on to be a CMO of many companies in the Silicon Valley and vice president, uh, brand head of brand at Adobe, uh, ran Cisco's messaging and worldwide PR. 
uh, was the CMO and head of the WebEx online business and many other things. Um, today, I work as a consultant and I absolutely love the opportunity to get to work with companies like Grid Dynamics. And with panels like this, it's very exciting and very fun to work with amazing professionals uh, who teach me something every day. So that's our panel. Um, we are very appreciative to you, our, our audience, for joining us today. And I thought that a nice way to get started, instead of just turning right to our panel, might be to turn to our audience and ask you a question. So I've got a, a little poll for you all to participate in. So get ready, because I've got a few more. So um, we really want your thoughts. So um, Anna, if you can put up the first poll for us. And if you haven't used a poll before, you go down to there's a polling button that you'll see at the bottom of the screen when the poll comes up that you can click on to be able to answer the poll. So uh, just, just answer number one, um, please. You don't need to answer number two. Um, but number one is where are you in your cloud migration process? So just choose one of these, which is, um, are you still on-prem? Do you have some cloud, but still mostly on-prem? Um, and are you moving mostly to the cloud, but with a little left on-prem, or are you, are, you, are you all cloud, right? So take a minute, choose the one that best applies to you. And then we should be able to see the results, Anna or Alex, one of you, if you can show us those, that would be great. And we've got some numbers up. Okay. Well, it looks like the majority of you who have joined today are in the earlier part of the process. 66% um, are in the earlier part of the process of moving onto the cloud. So I think this should be a real, I think you joined the right webinar. I think this should be great. And I also think those of you who are in a little bit of the later stages may have some different challenges. We'll cover some of those as well. Um, and it sounds like no one's made it all the way up to heaven yet, which is all cloud. I'm not sure any company has to be honest with you, but, um, but I'm glad to see that you're all on the journey. So that's fantastic. Well, before I let you all do something else on this call because I want you to stay engaged and excited. Let's go to one more poll. So let's do poll number two. So one more poll for you all, and then we'll we'll start doing some of the heavy lifting here. So this is poll number, oh, it says one, but it's poll number two. So um, what best describes your company's migration to the cloud? So choose again, one of these that best describes where you're at. It's grow going really well. We're on time on budget and it's working um, better than before. It's going pretty well, but we have a few unexpected problems. It's been tougher than we thought, and we haven't started or in or in the very early stages, right? Just tell us how how tough it's how tough it's been for you. What the experience has been like, and then Anna, when. When you see most people have responded, if you can bring up the results, that would be great. I'm hoping most of you are going to say it's going really well, but I have this sneaking suspicion that, you know, it might might not quite be there. Okay. Well, oh gosh, no one says it's going really well. All right. Well, my suspicion was right. Uh, it's going okay for some, but it's it's been tougher than we thought and. We haven't started early stages is about 80%. Okay. Well, guess what? You're not alone. That's the good news. It, it is pretty tough. Um, it's a huge transition. Um, so hopefully today you'll come away with some really good thoughts and ideas around uh, not only what you can do to make that transition easier and better for you, but also, um, you know, just some specific ideas from what other companies have done. So I wanna show you now, let's just go to the next slide because we talked about where you all are at in your transitions. 
And if you look at the slide, um, this is an IDG, so it's pretty recently 2020 slide. Uh, they interviewed many companies and what they saw was that in the transition, most companies are where you guys said you're at, which is the majority are still on-prem. Most is on-prem, but moving to the cloud, right? So we've got about 28% that's on the journey of mostly cloud or all cloud. But look at the numbers for in 18 months, you're gonna to start to see some really significant changes. As many more people from that move from that, that kind of pinkish red category and then the dark blue into most of their network being in the cloud. So it's pretty clear that a lot of companies are putting a lot of investment and a lot of time and a lot of effort into making that transition and making that transition now. And first, I really want to applaud you all for, for taking that step and trying to make that happen because it is, it is a big, big project to undertake, but it's one that everyone's doing. And if, if you aren't there in 18 months into that kind of grayish area, you're probably lagging behind some of your big competitors. So I think it's really important to push to get that transition to happen now. So let's get into the meat of our presentation because now we wanna hear about, okay, how do we get to that gray and light blue area? So I'm gonna to turn to our panel. So can we go to the next slide? And I've got some questions for them. Um, I think they're questions that represent what you all in the audience might be thinking about. Um, and Anna, if you want to uh, stop sharing so we can just see people's videos, that would be really helpful. And I'm gonna kick off the first question um, which is about migrating to the cloud. And um, who sent this question? I'm going to start with you. Migrating to the cloud is, it's a huge project. I mean, this is many years it's going to take to get there. But, you know, the question is, being that it's so big, it's so time consuming, it's budget consuming, it's soul consuming, do the benefits outweigh the work that's involved? And you've been through it. So I think you're going to speak with some real experience here. Yes, thank you, June. Yes, um, great question. And the answer is, for, of course, from me is absolutely yes, right? Um, the bank definitely much, much larger uh, than you think. Um, I remember when I first um, trying to present and sell this um, back in 2016, socialized this uh, cloud migration strategy. Um, I asked our CEO back then, Marvin Ellison, who, who came from Home Depot, right, to JCPenney. And I asked him the question, um, when you build a house, um, what is the most important thing when you build a house? And of course, his answer is a, a, a strong foundation. Uh, is the most important thing. So that's basically the, the analogy that I always use. You need to have a very strong foundation, right? To build your digital capabilities on top of it. And think about the cloud, the cloud native, uh, some best architecture, best practices such as uh, microservices, APIs and stuff. Think about those as your foundation for your digital capabilities, right? Your online capabilities, regardless of which industry you're in. And what the, the benefits that I see with uh, the cloud foundation is, uh, number one, I think is speed to market, which is a very huge benefit, which I think is very much undervalued. And also it's very, very difficult to quantify in terms of benefits, right? Um, but my personal opinion is that the opportunity cost alone uh, from delaying or not enabling new business capabilities, right, to, to uh, potentially grow your business, that alone outweighs all the mig cloud migration work, in, in my opinion, right? And the speed to market is enabled by you're able to basically um, spin up your compute or your environment, like the infrastructure as a service, or even platform as a service, such as the messaging broker and persistent databases, right? 
And or even if you want to enable like AI ML right now, a lot of AI ML uh, capabilities are provided by many of the cloud providers, right? They have been democratized and uh, to a certain extent commoditized as well. So with that, those services, you can build a lot of business capabilities in a, in a faster manner. So the speed to market is number one. The second one, I think it relates more to um, retail is the um, ability to uh, leverage the elastic cloud uh, compute to basically reduce your operational and capital expenditure, right? And in the past, when you're on-prem, especially for retail, um, you have to basically procure and provision um, the burst traffic capacity, right? Even though the burst traffic capacity is only needed for the peak holiday seasons, where you have uh, you know, five to 10 times of uh, traffic coming in during those times, right? Or even sometimes with brand launches or product launches, uh, you, see, you see the spike in traffic as well. So the, the elastic compute, the ability to basically expand, burst that capacity, infrastructure capacity and shrink is a, is a huge value, right? Uh, you don't have to basically procure and provision those hardware um, in your data center. And you can just um, basically scale it up in the cloud. And once the high season or high traffic volume is over, you can always shrink it back. So those two are the main benefits that I see. Uh, those two are great benefits. And I love the idea of um, the elasticity of the cloud. And especially if you're in a business like retail that is gonna be very seasonal. So great, exactly. great back. And, and Ravi, do you wanna add anything to that? What have you seen from your perspective? Yeah, like there, there's kind of might combine a little bit of some of the other questions, but it, it's always beauties in the eye of the beholder, right? So it, it is a large undertaking. I'm sure Hussein can, can chat about uh, when you're doing a cloud migration, you're unpacking years of work that you probably haven't ever seen, right? Like a lot of times work is project-based. And so if you kind of in charge of unpacking decisions that happened several years ago, it could be, it could seem very daunting, uh, but absolutely like the benefit, like in my mind too, like it, it, it diagnosed the patient, certain industries are more elusive to it. Uh, but that the, the quintessential answer, it's great that Hussein works for JC Penney because like you're a quintessential use case for the cloud elastic compute. Uh, but anybody can be subject to that. You don't have to be particularly um, in retail at any given time, who knows when you're gonna have a runaway success or a system problem, like a thundering herd type of problem. And so by using elastic resources, um, the cloud, it's, it's easier. Uh, kind of like two quick points. Uh, also, it helps you focus on your core of your business. Uh, so with, I'm just gonna pretend like, you know, talking from Harness perspective, like we're able to deliver functionality for our clients that makes sense as core to our business instead of worrying about, do we have sufficient compute capacity in a particular cloud? Or going back to that democratization of uh, different technologies, uh, a lot of times uh, with cloud infrastructure, it's it's there's more to it than just the compute, the storage, the networking, like those three core foundations. And there's a lot of high margin services too. So look, for example, let's say I want to use Kubernetes for the first time. I might not be an expert in Kubernetes, but I can go spin up you know GKE, AKS, EKS fairly quickly and have a semi to almost operational piece of infrastructure ready to consume. Uh, we'll slip off the platform engineer for my end client. So again, it helps agility. It helps you focus in the core of your business and success is in the eye of the beholder. Yeah, great points. And I, I love the idea of agility with the cloud. I think it is, it fundamentally gets you out of the, uh, the, the hardware business and into the agile world of software. So I think absolutely wonderful. Um, so, so Max, I want to turn to you now and ask you a question, which is, um, we have so many people on this call who are in the early stages of this uh, cloud adventure. So um, from your experience, and I know you've worked with many companies to help them uh, get from a, a full on-prem into the cloud, what do you see as the key steps that a company needs to take to prepare for this vast project or even once they're, they've started it to continue to be ready to move to the next stage? 
Thank you, Jim. Uh, I, I think the most important uh, step uh, that any company needs uh, to make uh, in order to start this uh, transition to the cloud is uh, to uh, understand, uh, take a look at the all the applications and, and the systems that the company has and uh, understand uh, which ones it makes sense uh, to move to the cloud in the first place. Uh, because uh, when uh, uh, when you look at the entire application portfolio or the data platforms and everything else, uh, <clears throat> uh, the company the company might notice that uh, there are some applications which are in active development, and hence they would uh, benefit from this increased agility and uh, speed to market that the cloud brings. There are some applications which uh, 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 which uh, can benefit from uh, scalability and auto scaling. Uh, because uh, they, for example, are customer experience applications and the customer experience and customer traffic fluctuates over time uh, instead of back office applications. And uh, select those applications and select those use cases and uh, start with them and start small and prove the business value as you go. Because if you choose the wrong application and move to the cloud with the wrong one, you will not see any cost benefits and you will not see any benefits from agility and speed to market. So. Taking a look to summarize, uh, understanding uh, what applications and systems you want to move to the cloud and what new use cases you want to enable there, and uh, essentially separating them into, the sub in, into separate buckets of what applications you want to move. And for example, they don't require a lot of modernization, uh, maybe just a little bit of adjustments of like, changing databases and so on and so forth. Maybe some applications uh, are already cloud native and are using cloud native stack and uh, would be great benefits uh, to move to the cloud quickly. But some applications that might just make sense to leave in the data center for now. Yeah, that is such wise advice because you know we think about as technology people, we think, okay, how do we make this all happen? But then there's the people side of this as well, which is it's such a huge and long-term project that if you don't choose the right things and you can't succeed, the rest of the company may thwart you from being able to continue to get the budget and the resources to continue this transition. So I think choosing, I think what you're saying is choosing the right, um, the right pieces to begin with. It's almost like a chess game. You wanna choose the right pieces to set the strategy up correctly so that you can continue to build on that in the future. Um, I love that. Really, and it's much easier to, uh, uh, to basically continue if you experience success in the early stages of the game, than if you get disappointed by doing something and it's not bringing you benefits. Exactly. So, I mean, we all want to have success early on. So I think it just speaks to being, I think your two points that let's make sure we know what we want to move because there's things you're not going to want to move and you can't simply just pick it up and move it in most cases. So you have to think what is that transition, but secondly, moving the right things in the right order so that you do get early success is critical. So love that. Um, Okay, thank you, Max, for that. And now let's move to another question that I know is probably on a lot of people's minds, and that is, you know, and I especially think, Hussein, for you, what are typically the most challenging tasks or maybe the gotchas in a cloud transition? And, and I'd love to hear from you, what are some specific examples of some obstacles that you faced and that you had to overcome? as you embarked and rolled out on this project? Yes, um, there is definitely a lot, a lot of challenges that we face. And I'm just going to pick a couple, which I think is very, very important because I feel that um, many, many of the um, uh, engineering team, you know, focuses a lot on the, on the build phase, right? but they, they neglect a lot on the run phase, which is, which is the operation. So achieving operational excellence, right, to me is a very, very tough challenge during, during the migration and even after the migration, right? So how do you, so we talk about speed to market and how do you basically achieve speed and agility without sacrificing quality and stability? So that's a very, very uh, challenging task, right? So. Um, what we did was um, at the very beginning, I think we, we every time we release something, so we basically uh, try to release um, every two weeks, right? So from having six releases a year, we try to release uh, you know, up to 20 releases a year. And when we, when we try to achieve that type of uh, speed and agility, a lot of times we see um, stability issue every time we, after we release 
uh, a new feature uh, to production, right? Or capabilities. So we we have to enhance and strengthen the um, the test automation. So we have a release automation team, right? That basically just um, work closely with each of the um, um, functional capability team that is migrating to basically automate a lot of the the testing. So we, we try to follow the test driven development, try to make sure that we do a shift left mindset, right? Try to ensure enough test coverages is there so that we can uh, ensure uh, every single release, um, we, we, we don't see a lot of uh, stability issue or quality issue when, when, we, when we launch the release. So um, the other thing that we also do, I think is basically we, we kind of like look at a lot of the KPIs, like we have a site reliability engineering team that monitor like all the production every release and we use that as a KPI and a metric to basically measure our the success of our quality, right? It's not just moving fast. You have to move fast without sacrificing quality and stability. So that's, that's one uh, daunting task in my, in my opinion. The other one is um, cloud economics and financials. I think that is a very important one as well because uh, it's very different from managing uh, your financials uh, on-prem, right? It's so dynamic. You, you can get out of control very, very, very easily. So yeah. you need to have a very strong guardrails just to basically uh, optimize the costs and make sure that you have monitoring alerts for all the different consumption threshold, right? have the tool to help you predict and do an accurate forecast. And uh, there are tools out there like Cloud Health, even the cloud providers, uh, a lot of them have their own tool to help you uh, manage the, the, the cloud financials and economics. So those two are, 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 are very ch challenging tasks and we're still doing it right now. We're still trying to improve those, those areas. Yeah, that is really interesting. And I think your point about being able to manage what now becomes what was equipment to a service is really challenging because it's not like the service is going to stay static. It keeps, it's going to keep changing and people exactly. are going to keep adding to it. And all mm -hmm. of a sudden, you know, one group's going to be using a huge amount of resources and then that's going to change. So what you have to do is keep your eye on the ball so that you can stay within your budget or at least ask for more budget if you need it. But that is, it is a whole new world when you move to the cloud. So exactly. yeah, totally challenging. So thanks for sharing that. Um, so um, Max, you've worked with a lot of companies. I mean, have there been things that companies have learned or that you've learned that were kind of surprises that came up or obstacles that came up during the course of the transition? I actually want to talk about a trend that I'm noticing uh, over the past, uh, I would say, five years. Uh, when initially uh, we were uh, speaking with companies about uh, moving to the cloud, uh, many companies would consider moving to the cloud as what is currently known as lift and shift. Uh, when uh, people would just take their VMs and applications and uh, try to deploy them to the cloud and uh, do the kind of binary transition or do something like that. Uh, but uh, lately, more and more companies uh, I'm speaking with uh, want to uh, move to the cloud uh, and actually change how they deploy their applications, how they uh, provision in, 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 uh, how they provision infrastructure for them and then how they establish this continuous delivery process. Uh, because uh, uh, I guess this change in the mood, I would say, is uh, coming from the, uh, from, the uh, from the fact that when again, when you move uh, these VMs to the cloud, you might just not recognize a lot of value and now companies uh, actually are looking at how they modernize uh, their applications, technology stack and change their culture of how they're working with cloud. So uh, for someone new who is considering migration to the cloud, I would, uh, I would say, <clears throat> uh, again, take a look at the migration together with application modernization so that you can change this culture, change your technologies and change uh, a lot of things, essentially how you are delivering software. Yeah, that's great advice and very concrete advice as well. So um, audience, I wanna take a minute and ask you another question. Uh, related to the discussion we've been having. So Anna, if you can bring up the next poll, I'd love you all to chime in with your thoughts. 
on this one. So really, based on what we just talked about, where did you have or where do you expect to have the biggest challenges in migrating to the cloud? And um, you can choose any that apply here. Um, don't just go down and check them all. But I mean, what are the top ones that you think in your company are going to be your biggest challenges or have been your biggest challenges? Go ahead and click on the ones that you think apply to you and your company. And then we'll take a, take a look in a minute. And if there's one or some that you, you don't see on this list, if you want to add it into the Q&A, uh, we can discuss that. Okay, Anna, you want to bring up the, the results? All right, wow, well, we've got coverage across the board. Um, it looks like budget is probably the one that people are least worried about, which I'm I'm happy to see. I'm a little surprised because I think it can be fairly challenging. Um, but it looks like our big winner is uh, privacy and security. Uh, and then uh, finding the right people is also a real challenge, which is pretty understandable considering um, the tasks that you're going to be doing, not only to get there, to migrate, but um, I think as Hussein was saying, to actually operationalize this new world are going to be very different from the, the skills that people have had in the past. Um, and staying on schedule, another big one. But yeah, you guys, you've got, you've got the challenges across the board. So I think we're talking about the right topic. So thanks everybody for taking a minute to fill that one in. I'm gonna to go to my next question. Um, and Ravi, let me, let me ask you this one. So um, one area that can be really uh, concerning for, for companies is performance. And I think Hussein already touched on this. Um, companies have spent years optimizing for performance and then they're moving to the cloud, which means that you know, you're gonna to need to rethink how you optimize. Um, and as Hussein said, also how you optimize for staying within budget as well as for performance. But um, how do you ensure that an experience is as good, if not better, once a company has moved to the cloud? So how do you, how do you ensure that that user experience is a really good one in the cloud, as good as, if not better than it had been when it was on-prem? Yeah, yeah. So I think it's really key to like measure things. So user experience can be very subjective at times, right? Or the quintessential, the website slow. What's slow for me might be fast for Max right? or, vice, or vice versa. And so ha having good baseline data, what it was something was before versus what something going to be after is important. Also, it's usually not one big bang, right? You're moving piece by piece by piece by piece. And so it this even gets to be more challenging because certain services or certain parts of the application might move before other parts of the application. And so it's just staying on the rigor of it, right? Just keeping track of what's going on, monitoring it. If you have to revert anything, um, go ahead and go ahead and revert uh, revert back. Uh, because again, with, with the cloud, um, it, there's just this concept called the fallacies of distributed computing. Like <laughs> latency is a thing, right? If you're going from, well, I'm gonna pretend to DC area, like I have one on-prem data center here in Bethesda, Maryland. Uh, and then now we're going to uh, US East and US West on Amazon, like who knows where those data center, well, Amazon knows, but right, like their latency could come into play. Other things that you haven't thought of before will come into play. Um, you know, bandwidth is not infinite, right? So if you're using, used to connecting over a fiber channel in your data center, now you're connecting over some sort of shared, infrastructure in a public cloud vendor. And so just keeping track of that, right? But just have, making sure you're having a consistent user experience, it's, it is a challenge, right? Like the, having proper monitoring tools and uh, user experience uh, tracking tools is, is crucial for that. And um, you were the one who said, I think earlier about beauty being in the eye of the beholder. So from the end user's point of view, are there any thoughts around how you you know, get feedback there because while you might be monitoring everything and seeing good numbers, perhaps their experience, because for example, what Max said is, you know, you can't just whole stock move your apps over usually. 
So if the apps change and the user experience changes, how do you make sure that your end users are, are still happy and satisfied? Well, you don't want to see it on Twitter, right? Like, you know, <laughs> you know at JCPenney, why is my order going through? That's like the last place you want to see it, right? Like, you're like, oh boy, we have a problem. Um, but uh, my, my to really get to my compatriots here, but uh, yeah, there's there's lots of ways to like do use, end user testing, like real user testing, end user testing, synthetic testing, like there's a plethora of ways, but also making sure you get that right. Like we can be inundated with monitoring data because we get it from logs, we get it from the end user device, so we, like where do we get it from? And also is it internal customer, or external customer, right? Our internal teams might complain differently than our external customers. And so how do you go about managing that? There's just a lot of like, how do you wade through the noise? Um, are you monitoring for infrastructure? Are you monitoring for app performance? Are you monitoring for one of the core pillars like compute or networking saturation? There's, there's lots and lots and lots and lots of stuff there. And so kicking it back to like Hussein's point, like they, he, no, their organization has a reliability engineering team, right? So like it takes close coordination with, you know, several teams monitoring reliability engineering, cloud infrastructure at the major things you're going right. So it's not one person or one tool, it's an army of, uh, or a tribe of people uh, to make that happen. Yeah, so that really suggests that part of the, um, your success is gonna be based on how well you build a cross-functional team and get, groups to work together um, to ensure that ultimately the experience is a good one. So I love that. I think that's really wise advice. Um, Hussein, like now you've, you've been going through this and I'm wondering how your end users are reacting to this and how your performance has been. And I know you've been really trying to, you know, create a great operational team and great operational results, but um, how has it been working for the people who are on the receiving end of the services you're providing? Yeah, as, um, as I mentioned earlier in my introduction, uh, we have a, a dedicated uh, performance engineering team, right? Which for every single releases, we actually uh, do a performance and load test on, uh, at the, at the, on the backend side at the API le uh, level, right? On the API and services level. And even on the front end, uh, we also use tools like web page tests and you know lighthouse and all those things to basically understand uh, even the the page download time from a front front end perspective. So we have front end, back end, and site wide a uh, load test. Every single releases we we do that. So we have a shift left mindset. We do performance tests for every single release, right? We involve the performance engineers in many of the um, feature requirements and scoping uh, sessions. So that they understand like what are some of the features that may impact the, the performance of the site or, right, or, or certain capability or services. So, so that's, that's basically how we, we handle it. And it is very important because um, it's not just about available. When you, when you run an e-commerce site, it's 24 seven, right? Your site has to be highly available, has to be highly scalable and the performance has to be very, very fast. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, that's great. Really, really helpful to illuminate it because a lot of times we just kind of gloss over, it's like performance, but then there's so many pieces to it. Um, it's, it's so important to look at all of those if you really want to have great performance. So I think that, you know, as I'm listening to you all talking, I'm realizing there's so many aspects to moving to the cloud and you're going to have to get tools. You're going to have to get a team that knows how to do this or expertise into your organization to help you do it. You're gonna to need to have a cloud vendor. You're gonna to need to be able to manage the utility of the cloud that you're using on a regular basis that you may not have insight into who's using it and how they're using it all the time. So Max, from your point of view, you know, as companies are moving to the cloud, there are gonna be a lot of expenses. And you know, in the old days of on-prem, you know, it was essentially the equipment and the software, right? But now we've got all these different expenses. I mean, just listening to Hussein talk, it's like so many tools he's naming off. So you're going to have to get new tools, right? You're going to have to get new training for your team. You're going to have to probably get new people. You may need new vendors. You're definitely going to need your cloud services and the utilities that go along with that. So how do you, Max, approach with your clients um, keeping cost from being a barrier to getting the project done. And I'd love to get your thinking on it and your wisdom. 
the interesting thing with the cloud is actually like if uh, if you're migrating to a data center, the upfront cost uh, might be extremely high, uh, but then uh, your uh, kind of run rate is um, relatively predictable. With the cloud, uh, the upfront cost of the cloud itself is usually very low, and uh, it's uh, relatively uh, relatively easy to start using the cloud. The problem <clears throat> uh, the companies typically start seeing problem after several months or years working with the cloud when they start seeing that this cost actually keep going higher and higher and higher, and you actually need to keep them in check. And uh, there, are there is a number of uh, ways uh, uh, to uh, control that and, uh, to, uh, and, and, and to manage your cost. I, I want to probably pick uh, uh, four of them. One is, again, when you migrate the applications and modernize them in the process, then uh, if you use containers instead of deploying these applications on VMs, then you can save uh, easily like 30% uh, of your uh, infrastructure cost just by reducing the overhead on, 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 on the VMs, or maybe even more, depending on how efficiently you use them. Uh, second is uh, definitely using uh, auto scaling uh, uh, and predictive scaling uh, to the right extent. Because uh, if you don't use that flexibility and that agility that the cloud gives you, uh, then uh, obviously you are just uh, uh, you're just paying more. Uh, and uh, especially like Hussein said, for the uh, applications which are customer which which are customer oriented, there are huge fluctuations of traffic during the day, during the week, uh, and during the year. Uh, for a retail, it might be I don't know like uh, two orders of magnitude. Uh, between uh, a night uh, somewhere in, on Wednesday on a regular day and the peak uh, on the um, on the holiday season in the middle of the Black Friday. Uh, it's important to, uh, to, to notice here that uh, there are some applications, uh, if you design them right, you can actually auto scale them uh, pretty efficiently uh, with uh, the cloud features the cloud gives you. Uh, for some applications uh, which are not stateless and are just more complicated. Uh, you might think about something like predictive scaling when you uh, uh, figure out the load on these applications, uh, historical load, and then using this historical load, you, pr you project uh, what would be your utilization going forward and then you pre-scale them and essentially make sure that uh, you can meet those new traffic requirements that are coming. Uh, the third thing is uh, that majority of the companies uh, might miss uh, is uh, the lightweight continuous delivery process. Uh, because uh, companies might spend uh, twice as much on uh, dev test environments than on production environments. And these costs are often overlooked. Uh, and uh, these costs are, are usually spiking when the, new, when the company first migrates to the cloud because uh, there is a lot of freedom. Now we can provision environments all the way you want. And uh, developers are typically asking for a lot of them. QAs are asking for a lot of them. And often they just forget to, de to delete them when they're done. So uh, of course, you need to uh, monitor that and uh, just kind of remove those environments. But also rethink how you release your software. Uh, because uh, you can achieve uh, way lesser cost on the uh, dev test environments if you design your CI CD process uh, in the right way. And if it's a more lightweight continuous delivery process. Uh, and the final one, of course, you need, uh, you need monitoring. You need to uh, understand uh, how much you are paying and you need a uh, breakdown by project, by department, by application, by the type of environment so that you can actually figure out where you are overspending and uh, reduce the cost there. Yeah, that, that's such wise advice. And I'm definitely learning from you. And I know I've heard some of these things from customers before, but others are new to me. And I think things that we should all be thinking about as we're going forward on this. So thank you for sharing that. I think it's uh, very pragmatic. Um, Ravi, would you like to add anything around costs? Are there any any uh, tips that you have for companies on how to, how to manage or prepare for the cost of this transition? Yeah, like Max had a lot of very salient points, right? Like the upfront costs are not a lot, but the gotchas usually come months down the line. And then also you made a lot of investment in staff and like there's a lot of there's a lot of overhead that you have to budget for, right? Like a like retraining people, retooling the platforms, like there's a lot of sunk costs going into it, but the initial, you know, 
when you get that bill from the cloud provider is usually pretty small. Um, I would say like democratize that information pretty quickly. Um, to be frank, like when I had workloads running in a data center, I actually had no idea how much they cost. Like I didn't know what the internal ca calculations were for like our system engineering team to get charged back to my department. Like it was a question mark. I do know how much Amazon charges me per month because it goes to my credit card, right? So like I know exactly how much it costs. But getting that information out to different teams can be like a really challenge. I think this one hit the nail on the head that it might be tied up with the finance department, right? So if does your engineering teams know this democratization of cloud costs, just disseminating that information uh, to what makes sense to the engineering teams, like how much does an application cost? How much does this particular resource cost? Uh, I would say a lot of this thing called FinOps, um, this type of concept. Uh, I would say in, organizations should march towards that because it enables um, efficiencies uh, to be made that if you need to adjust, you know, good fin ops practices will say, hey, adjust for cost optimization. So, yeah. Yeah, great. Thank you for the, the additional thoughts. I think that's very helpful. Um, so, Hussein, I'm going to put you on the spot here and ask you a question that I, I actually haven't asked you before, but I, I'm actually really curious after we've been through this, this conversation, which I, it's been on my mind since we've been talking, which is, how did you, how did you manage people in making this transition? Because I know you mentioned earlier that you, <clears throat> you worked with Max and the grid team on it, but I'm wondering, like, did you have special training for your team? Did you, did you need to hire new people? You obviously hired grid to help you, but I'd love to just hear your thoughts on, on the people side of making that transition. Yeah. Yeah. I think this is um, a great question, right? So, um, People process tools and tools is the easiest one to migrate, right? People and process and having that um, uh, uh, agility and flexible culture is, is, very, is, not, is not easy. And um, just let me tell you how I first started it. I mean, I, I first told my boss that, um, um, you know, I can't use probably this, the same um, system in integrator that we have been using in the past. Right, I need, I need a consultant company uh, that that is strong in terms of uh, cloud computing. Number one, number two, and strong in um, uh, automation as well, like continuous integration and continuous delivery. So I I I had previous um, experience relationship with Grid Dynamics where we we try to automate our uh, software delivery process with CI/CD. And that's where I started uh, engaging with Dynamics and you know, uh, Victoria, Max, they were here uh, at the very beginning. And that's how, that's how we get started. I mean, we start small, we think big, but we start small. We, we get a few, um, um, what do you call that? A few uh, use cases, which is very, we, which we think is very easy for us to implement and try it out, right? And whatever POC, proof of concept or proof of technology that we have, we actually use that as a reference implementation, right? And we went to production with that, right? Um, and of course I have to cherry pick a few uh, strong engineers that have the growth mindset that is willing to learn um, new, new things and, and not afraid of doing that, right? And you gotta switch your, your core um, of like your system administration team to more like a system engineering team, right? So the administration mindset has to go away. The engineering mindset, the automation has to, has to come in. And that's, that's very important. And, and it's not easy. And then even automation, automating tests, uh, uh, the releases and the tests, uh, not every single uh, engineering team is doing well or follow that, right? Some some team has a higher test coverage, some team has, uh, doesn't. So definitely like um, influencing and changing the culture is a much daunting task compared to just migrating your, you know, the tool or your application to the cloud. Yeah, that's really interesting. And did your um, did your budget for people go up, down or stay about the same? The people wise, I think it will, um, it will probably go up. The reason why is because um, 
talent acquisition was a, a, was a big challenge. That was like five, six years ago. Um, not, not many um, people, and even if they're doing it, they're doing it around the same time, right? Late 2015, early 2016. And uh, trying to find the right, the right talent uh, was, was very, very difficult. And uh, definitely there's a lot of, uh, even some talents that we hire, uh, they probably don't have the cloud computing experience, but we just train them. As long as they have that uh, strong engineering mindset and willing to learn, I think that's, that's what we seek in terms of uh, um, great talents within our team, right? And especially that core foundational team is very important to find uh, the right people there, right? is always uh, seek for quantity versus, uh, uh, sorry, quality versus quantity, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not, you don't need to hire an army of people. What you need to hire is a few really good engineers to basically help uh, uh, build that foundation and start okay. up the whole migration process. Yep. That's, that's great. That's really, really helpful advice. And it's good just to have people's, people's expectations get set around that. And so Max, now you're coming at it from the other side, which is, you know, you provide these services to many, you know, big brands out there like JCPenney and many, many others. Um, do you have any tips for companies um, on the people side of this business and how you manage that and what they can expect there? I would say that Kasim just summarized it uh, brilliantly. And uh, I want to just say one thing that uh, to basically reiterate and focus on one thing that uh, Hussein said. Uh, when starting this uh, uh, cloud, uh, cloud transformation program, uh, it's important to pick uh, the right people within your own team and then uh, maybe bring some experts uh, from the outside, uh, but then put them together and they will learn uh, by doing this transformation together. And then you can disseminate that knowledge. You will have some seed of the culture within the company and you will be able to do that. And uh, uh, this is what uh, Forrester calls agile co-creation, agile co-innovation, like the new engagement of, um, uh, of vendors uh, with, uh, with, with companies. And this is uh, how we typically uh, work. This is how we work with uh, Jesse Penny, with Hussein. And this is how we work with um, pretty much all of our uh, clients. Uh, and I can say that uh, this training, if, if, if done right, uh, this training can be done uh, relatively fast because uh, cloud, although it might be complex, it might be daunting uh, task to begin with, but um, this long journey starts with a simple one short step. Uh, and then uh, uh, we work with, with the clients uh, when the first engagement took us, let's say several months uh, to provision the first set of uh, applications on the cloud and transform them, replatform them, implement something new. Uh, but then the infrastructure team already knew how to set up the cloud. Security was already set up. All the accounts were there. All the best practices were, were, were there. And the, all the frameworks and, all the and, and the core platform was there. So then with that, we were able to scale to tens and hundreds of applications next year. Okay, that's actually great advice and really very pragmatic and helpful, I think, for our audience. Um, we are, unfortunately, we're, we're running out of time. This time has flown by, uh, for me at least, I've been really, it's been really great, great, great advice, I think really helpful. Um, I do wanna just take one audience question because I know we, I have a few, but we're not gonna have time for all of them. But I'm, Hussein, I'm gonna give it to you because uh, you've just been working on this and I think you may have some good advice for us, but. It was also something that came up in the poll and it is around security. So uh, somebody wrote in and said, one of our challenges, how to best handle security once we have all our data in the cloud, any thoughts on this? And I, I'd love to hear your thoughts. I'm gonna to have to ask you to keep it to about a minute because we're running out of time. Yeah, yeah, so no, if you can offer no, in a minute no, on security would be great. Yeah, it's, it's, security is it, you know, gonna be a long answer, but the, you know, Try to make it short. Basically, we we work very we collaborate very closely with our IT security team, right? To make sure that like all the PCI data, you know, everything is encrypted. We 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 have uh, we created a DMZ with all the uh, firewall intrusion protection or detection system, right? Everything within within our uh, VPC. So we have we have a DMZ uh, just for the e-commerce platform because you have you know, you're exchanging um, 
data, there's a, uh, you know, data at rest, there's also, you know, data in transition, right, which we need to protect, like everything is SSL based. Um, so security is very important. And I would recommend um, partner closely with the security team and help them understand there are a lot of um, services within within your cloud provider can that can actually enhance and make make the security a lot more secure than hosting your um, applications on prem, right? So that's something that I, I think is you need the cloud providers help and your security collaborate uh, strongly with the um, IT security team to make sure that um, that understanding is there, right? Uh, once, once, once you created that DMZ zone and all, all those things, I think everything is just um, like if there's a PII data that you want to encrypt. Um, you know, uh, many cloud providers provide the encryption, and then you, you, the, the, the customer owns the encryption key, right? So, so even data at rest, you can encrypt the data if you want to. So, in short, that's 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 the answer on the security side. Yeah, oh, well, that's a pr pretty good top line answer with some really pragmatic advice for people again. So I love those tips. And yeah, it's a much bigger topic, obviously, but at least I think you've pointed people in the right direction. So unfortunately, this time has flown by and we're going to have to wrap up right now. But I want to um, I want to close by thanking our panelists. So Hussein and Ravi, fantastic feedback, loved your enthusiasm, loved your very hardcore tips and things that people can actually think about and take back to work. Max, you as well, great, great feedback. And I do want to thank Grid Dynamics and Max for sponsoring this webinar. Really appreciate that. And most of all, I really want to thank our audience, um, number one, for coming and taking the time um, to listen and also to participate with our polls. Really appreciate uh, you sharing where you're at. And I would like to wish all of you uh, the most success with your cloud transition and a really great rest of your day. So thank you so much. Please join us. We'll be offering another webinar very soon in the future. We'd love to have you be a part of that. Talk to you all later. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Cheers.